I'll begin reading to you here in 1 Peter 5 at verse 5. I'll read verses 5, 6, and 7, and then we'll get into our study. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 5, reading to verse 7. Peter writes, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And so it's, it's often been said that the way up uh, comes by first going down. And, and that's simply another way of saying that honor normally follows humility. Like the, uh, like the scripture says in Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. Before honor is humility. So believers anticipate a future inheritance. That's what he's been saying to us, sharing in the glory uh, that the Lord would give to us, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this will take place after we leave here to be with him in heaven. So until that time, we do go through times of suffering. But as we've been looking at First Peter, we go through times of suffering, but it is not without purpose. Now, Peter already had made that clear when we were in the first chapter. He spoke of the suffering of Jesus, he said, and the glories that would follow. And so Peter continues instructing the church concerning daily life. And this life that he's speaking about is something that is going to continue his thought of life in the church this life is lived with respect for one another, especially for those who are older. Now, earlier he had spoken of the church elders. In this particular portion, he continues on, but is speaking of those who are chronologically older. And he, he begins by saying, likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to those old cranky goats in the church. Submit yourself to your elders. Now, why would he begin by specifically targeting those whom he refers to as the ones who are younger, those who are younger? Well, in every society, the younger are often the most headstrong of any group. Very often, they refuse to follow counsel from those who are experienced in life. All of us in this room can understand that. Some of you are still younger and uh, to some degree, you may understand that. As you grow older, you understand it even more. You know, when I was younger, I thought my dad was, you know, I was 17. I thought my dad was kind of stupid. And when I was 21, I, I was amazed at how, how much the old man learned in four years. Now, that's basically just a paraphrase of Mark Twain. When you're young, you think you know everything. As you begin to grow older, you begin to realize that you have much to learn. And in, in groups, very often, the younger, we all know, those of us who have been young and maybe grown older now, we understand that. Because we've been there. We, we have been in the place where we thought we knew more than those who were older than us. And so he begins. He begins by saying, you need to respect those who are your elders. You need to do this because very often those who are younger refuse to follow the counsel of those experienced in life. When you read your Bible, you see many, many kinds of the, uh, examples of this kind of thing. But one of my favorite examples is found in the book of 1 Kings. In 1 Kings, uh, we have a, a, a man by the name of Rehoboam. Rehoboam uh, was Solomon's son, King Solomon's son. And so when Solomon dies, the scripture tells us that his son Rehoboam ascended the throne of Israel. Now, there was a popular leader at that time by the name of Jeroboam. And Jeroboam had been exiled in Egypt. But while in exile, Jeroboam had been told, it had been communicated to him that Solomon had died. And so when it was communicated to him Solomon was dead, he returned to Israel. And so he and uh, leaders of Israel went before King Rehoboam and they met with him. In 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 4, it says that they said to Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we'll serve you. Now, Rehoboam had told them 
They gave him three days to consider what they had said. And here, here's where it became a problem because Rehoboam first spoke to Solomon's elders and asked how he should respond. In response to the question, how should I respond to the request? They gave him this advice. They spoke to him saying, if you'll be the servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they'll be your servants forever. And so they basically gave him wise counsel. Listen to them. Their, their concerns are reasonable. Don't be bullheaded. Humble yourself. He said, if, you, if you'll be servant to these people today, serve them, answer them, speak good words to them, they'll be your servants forever. That's good advice. But Rehoboam rejected their advice. What he did is he went and spoke to the young men that he had grown up with. And their counsel was different. They said to him, treat the people harshly. Show them how strong you are. And so he addressed Jeroboam. He spoke to the elders and he gave them his answer. In 1 Kings 12, 11, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father, father chastised you with whips. I will chastise you with, with scorpions, with scourges. He went on, it, it goes on to say in, in 1 Kings 12, 13, the king answered the people roughly, rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And that resulted in the division of the nation. The Bible in 1 Kings 12, 16 says, when all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, what share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel. Look after your own house, David. So the Israelites went home. Because he listened to the counsel of the younger with no experience, who said, treat them harshly. And he answered them roughly. He divided the nation. Well, the younger are to listen to the older, especially the elders, the older people who have gained wisdom to following the Lord. And so Peter is speaking here concerning this kind of thing, and he's giving a command. And the command really has what would be called a dual application. In the life of the church, the elders who are in authority are to be respected. Their spiritual leadership is to be submitted to accordance in accordance with the scripture. Remember, in general life of the church, the chronologically older were to be respected. The Greeks and the Jews considered a person young if they were under 40 years of age. And for this reason, Peter is exhorting the young to respect those who are older, to respect those who have life experience. It's similar to what Paul had written to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5 when he said, Do not rebuke an older man. Exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers. Older women as mothers. Younger women as sisters with all purity. And so he's just basically speaking concerning the fact that age should be respected. And so he says, on the one hand, and that's what his command is as it begins, verse 5, you younger people submit yourselves to your elders. elders. Show them respect. Show them deference. Listen to their counsel. That's a wise thing to do. I remember when my father went home to be with the Lord. My father was 74, and I was 50. And I remember I went into his den after we moved. Uh, my, mother, my mother moved to New Mexico, and after the, 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 the truck that was carrying all of her belongings departed, and they made their way off to New Mexico. I remember sitting in my parents' den and I remember just speaking to myself, speaking out loud and asking the question, now who am I going to speak to? Now who's going to give me advice? Because I looked to my father for his, his counsel. I looked to my father for his wisdom and I respected his wisdom. No, he wasn't a theologian and no my father wasn't well-versed in Scripture. My father was just a good man who loved Jesus. My father was somebody who could give good advice. And, and it was at that time that I began, began to realize that, that the Lord is now doing a new work in me, that I was supposed to become a man in a deeper sense than I was up to that point. The younger respect the older. But he goes on in verse 5, and he says, All of you be submissive to one another. So submission, when he's speaking about in the church, is not simply to those who are older. It should be the common life of the church. It's been referred to as what is called mutual submission. In Ephesians 5.21, it reads, submitting to one another in the fear of God. 
So this kind of mentality of, of being willing to yield, to listen, to understand, and to work together is a very good thing. It produces harmony, and it undermines the strife that can destroy the body of Christ. But how can I do that? How, how can I be a person who actually learns to submit and, and, and is, is willing to be submitted to one another? He says, be clothed with humility. Why? Because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. How's that going to happen? By being clothed with humility. The word clothed is an interesting word. The, the word is used normally of what we would call an outer garment. Some would refer to it as a, an apron. It was an apron that was worn by slaves. And this apron worn by the slaves was something that distinguished them as slaves in opposition to free people. So they wore a garment that pointed them out as slaves. And so Peter is saying, clothe yourselves with humility. It distinguishes you as a servant and put humility on as if it's your work clothes. And in doing this, if you're clothed with humility, it will reveal your subjection, submission to one another. Jesus' entire ministry was built on voluntary humility and service. And this is what Jesus did at the Last Supper when he washed their feet. John tells us in chapter 13 of his gospel that, that after the supper had been ended and the devil already having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him, that he rose from the table after supper and he girded himself with a towel, took a wash basin and began to wash the feet of his men. We all know that story. And he came to his apostle Peter and Peter looks at him and says, are you washing my feet? You will never wash my feet. Because Peter saw that as a humility, even a humiliation that shouldn't be done. You're the master. You should not, not be washing the feet of those of us who are around the table. And Jesus, that's when he rebuked him. And he said to him, um, if, I wa if I don't wash your feet, I have nothing to do with you. And you remember the response of that impetuous man named, named Peter. He said, give me a bath. Just give me my head. And just bathe me. And the one, Jesus said, who's... Who's our, he said, it's already been bathed, only needs his feet to be washed. Why? Because you walk in the dusty streets, your feet are dirty, the rest of you isn't. And it, it speaks of our walk with the Lord, the humility and all, and the cleansing that needs to take place. So Jesus spoke of himself as being really a servant. In Matthew 23, 11, he said it, he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And so his entire ministry was built on voluntary humility and service. Now, why is it important for us to do this? Why, why should I humble myself, be submissive? Why should I be clothed with humility? Well, he says, because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Remember, it is pride that caused Satan to fall. Isaiah 14 records what are called the five I wills of Satan. And in Isaiah 14, he was going to ascend above the, the stars. He was going to be like God. And he said, will you? I'll cast you down. It was pride that caused Satan to fall. And he's saying here that God is set in battle array against the proud. When the word resist is used, that's another term for setting yourself in battle array. In other words, he is constantly opposing. He's unceasingly at war with the proud. So being clothed with humility produces unity and peace in the church. It's a beautiful virtue to exhibit towards the unsaved and those who are hostile. And that's what was taking place again in 1 Peter when the world was turning in persecution against the church. So instead of seeking to retaliate, getting even, clothe yourself with humility, be a servant. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride shall bring him low. Honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. And that's what he says in verse 5. God gives grace to the humble. If you want to grow in your understanding of the grace of God, it begins with humility. And it is by his grace that we mature in our understanding of what Jesus has done for us. And as we grow in grace, we grow in experiential knowledge of the Lord. 
In 2 Peter 3.18, he says it like this. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Grow in grace. Grow in the understanding and knowledge of the Lord. Somebody said to grow in grace is to grow in our understanding of what Jesus did and to grow in our appreciation of the grace that we have been given. So as we humbly submit to God and to one another, God begins to pour out and manifest his grace upon, it, upon us. And that's something we should desire for as long as we are here on earth. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, verse 6, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Therefore, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Accept with humility your present circumstances because these circumstances have been allowed by God. It is hard to kick against the prods. There are times when we are so upset that we're going through certain things. And so we resist and we get mad and we complain and we whine. And Peter would simply say, you've got to get to the point of simply accepting where you're at. Because when you accept where you're at in terms of the things you're going through, that's the place that God can begin to show you his grace and help you to find the places of his, to escape so that you may grow in your understanding of what he's all about. Humble yourself. He's going to exalt you in due time. The word exalt means to raise to dignity, to raise to honor and happiness in his perfect moment his perfect time bible matthew 23 12 says whoever exalts himself will be humbled but whoever humbles himself will be exalted i was sitting in in a uh, an auditorium in albuquerque i've shared this before but it's been a while i'll bore you with it those of you who may have heard this story before and Rawl, i had gone with a guy named Rawl reese most of us know Rawl. And um, Raul was doing a radio uh, rally. This is many years ago, over 40 years ago. And I had said, Raul, I'd like to go with you and see how you do radio rallies. I'd like to learn. So I went with him. And I was seated with uh, my family. And there were about 700 people or so. This was many years ago. This was before Calvary Chapel of Albuquerque existed. And so I'm sitting there. And Raul is standing up in the, in the platform in the stage. And he goes, uh, before I teach, and everybody really loves Raul and all of that, very popular. And before I teach, I'd like to introduce the ones who came with me. Now, I was sitting next to these two girls and my family and these two girls. And I still remember thinking, oh, he's going to introduce us. And when he introduces me, they're going to really be, wow, I'm sitting next to somebody who came with Rawl. That's I honestly thought that. How sickening is that, right? I mean, it's sickening. It is sickening. And I'm going, yeah, they're going to be impressed. And so, so Rawl says, I brought my brother Xavier. And everybody cheers for Xavier. And I'm thinking, oh. And then and I brought my, my brother-in-law, Gary, and Everybody cheers, and he introduced a couple more and never introduced me. And I'll never forget the sensing of the Spirit in my heart as he seemed to say, oh, you're pretty important, aren't you? You really impressed those girls, didn't you? I'll never forget that, how humbled. How, I thought I was humiliated, but no, I was humbled at that time. God humbles the proud. So, you know, be careful, be careful because he's faithful to do that. And so he'll humble the proud. He gives grace um, to those who are humble. And, and he says that if you humble yourselves under his mighty hand, he'll exalt you in the right moment. And then continuing, he goes, so cast, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Your care is another word for anxiety. Cast your fears and anxieties on the Lord. There's hardly anything that is... A greater, uh, a more worthless use of, of energy than worry and anxiety. Because worry and anxiety is simply being concerned over things you have no control over anyway. So it's a waste of your energy. 
So he says you should cast your anxiety, your care upon him. That word casting is a Greek word that means to hand over, but it literally speaks of throwing it off of you. Throw it off. Psalm 27, verse 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. In Psalm 55, verse 22, cast your burden upon the Lord. He shall sustain you. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Why should I cast my care on him? Why should I, when I'm greatly concerned, which I can be, why should I do that? Because he cares for me. He's not indifferent to our sufferings. He's concerned for us. Psalm 34, 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. Why should I cast my cares? Why should you cast your cares on him? Because he cares for you. Because he loves you. He loves you more than you love yourself. He loves you and will take care of you. And it's part of the growing up process of becoming a mature believer where we learn to cast our cares on him. I'll be sharing a few few things this upcoming Sunday in our study of 1 Thessalonians that will build this particular point up. I won't go there with you now, but on Sunday I'll share a few things with you uh, about this. God cares for us, and so cast your cares on him. He says in verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Well, your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Be sober and vigilant. Now, if there's anybody who can teach us about being vigilant, being awake and alert, it's Peter. Remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus had said, this night all of you are going to abandon me. In Matthew 26, 31, Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. It's written, I will strike the shepherd. The sheep of the flock will be scattered. When Jesus said that, Peter got upset. He got very upset. And he actually debated, argued with Christ. In Matthew 26, 33 through 35, Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, shut up. No, Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. He was so confident in his love for Christ. I will never deny you. I will never betray you. I will never say I don't know you. I would never do that. I would die. And we know that that's, there's, there's a reality in that boast that it was actually, it was grounded in, in a self-belief that later on he acted on. Remember when they came to take Christ? Remember how he drew a sword and tried to take off Malchus's head? Took off a portion of his ear? Remember that? That demonstrated I, I'm ready to die for you. And I have I've come to believe very strongly that it's easier to die in the manner he was willing to die, fighting, to go down fighting, than it is in the way he was actually brought down. Because he was there ready to give up his life. He was convinced that he would do so. He was convinced that, that he was the one who would die on behalf of Christ. He was convinced of all the apostles. He would the one who would be, be the one who remained faithful. But on that same night, He not only denied Christ, but he did it exactly like Jesus said. He did so three times. All of them really did. They all forsook him and fled. They all had to learn they weren't as strong in faith as they thought. Remember how that, on that same night that Jesus went into the garden and agonized in prayer? And while in prayer, the officers and the soldiers came and and took him away. And when Jesus was taken... They did exactly what he said they would do. Mark 14, verse 50, they all forsook him and fled. Just like he said they would. So, does Peter know what he's talking about? Yes, he does. He knows that the adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Therefore, be sober and vigilant. Be aware. Be aware. Now, God cares for us. God is carefully watching over us, the scripture teaches us. 
But though God is watching over us, it doesn't mean that the devil doesn't attack. The fact seems to be that he attacks the ones who love and serve the Lord most faithfully. Once again, the Apostle Peter is a great example. In Luke 22, 31 and In 32, the Lord said to him, using his name, Simon, 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 indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Now, when he said he may sift you as wheat, when when wheat is sifted, the action is very violent. And what it does is it separates the wheat grain from the chaff, the exterior. And so Peter had been sifted. But in the sifting, his faith is refined. And as a result, he became one who had empathy and humility. He actually grew to have compassion and encouragement. The Lord will sift you too. And when we boast and say, I would never deny you, don't be surprised if the enemy doesn't take that as an opportunity to to sift you, to test you. Let's see what you really are made up of. For them, under stress and persecution, it's easy to become distracted. So the believers who are under these kinds of conditions, you need to be sober. You need to be vigilant. Now, when he speaks of being sober, in the literal sense, it means to refrain yourself from intoxication. But in this context, it's speaking of being serious-minded. Be sober-minded about your love for Christ. Cultivate self-control. Keep your mind on the things of the Lord. The psalmist in Psalm 119, 98 says, You through your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. They're they're ever with me. So be sober-minded. Be aware that the enemy is patrolling and is looking to take you down. You might be saying, I'm not that important. Yes, you are. You just don't realize it. You're somebody who has, in front of others, has said you follow Christ. Most of us, I'd say, have. You've confessed Christ before man. What are you up to? I, I got saved. What do you do on Sundays? I go to church. Really? So you've made your test. You've, made, you've stated it. People know you. See, the one who is backsliding, the one who's lukewarm, they really, really damage the body of Christ because it makes all Christians look weak. But you, you said, I love the Lord. You're an enemy. You're an enemy of Satan. And he's going to try and take you down. He's going to try and take you down. And so he's like a lion. He's patrolling. He's looking for the one that he can take down. And he's, 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 taken, he's taken notice of you. We know that the, the devices of Satan are, are subtle. He can actually take you by surprise. Again, Peter didn't deny the Lord Jesus when, when Jesus was, when they were about to take him. He actually had fought to protect him. Uh, he denied Jesus when he was sitting by a campfire, warming himself, overestimating his own strength. In 1 Corinthians ten twelve, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. So be humble and watchful, be on guard. Your enemy is on the prowl. Notice he says your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. He's on the prowl. He never sleeps. He is a relentless predator. He doesn't take Labor Day off. He works overtime on Labor Day. Remember in the book of Job in chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, how that the, uh, there was a convocation of the angels and Satan came amongst them? And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth, going back and forth in it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Have you considered him? Have you looked at him? You see, the Lord is giving, uh, (coughs) calling rather Satan to give an account of himself. And he did. When have you been up to? I've been going back and forth throughout the earth. I've been up to no good. Literally, that's what he's saying. I've been up to no good. I've been roaring. I'm like a roaring lion, seeking whom I may devour. 
So what have you been doing? And he tells him, I've been prowling. I'm never resting. I'm, I'm looking for someone to destroy. So as he speaks, God says, have you considered my servant Job? Have you set your heart on him? Have you set your heart on my servant? He's a genuinely righteous man. There's no one like him is what the Lord is saying. You are looking for defects. Have you found any in him? The word considered means to examine. Have you looked at him closely? Are you studying him? Here's something very practical for you. Once again, I use my friend Rawl as an example. Those who know Rawl know that he has been a martial artist for the, a good portion of his life. He's been an eighth degree black belt in Sansu Kung Fu for 50 some years. And he's, he is a very, I've seen him work out and all, and I can say that he's a very accomplished martial artist. He's in the Martial Arts Hall of Fame and the whole nine yards. I mean, this guy is a very accomplished man when it comes to the discipline of Kung Fu. And why do I say that? It's because I can beat him up. No, it's because <laughs> I was having a conversation with him once. We were talking. And he said something to me years ago I've never forgotten. And he said, when he was in the world, he said, and this is his words. And we were just talking. He said, when I was going to fight a man, I studied him. And when he said, I studied him, that made sense to me. What does that mean? Well, for those of you who enjoy uh, martial arts or if you watch MMA or boxing or whatever, everybody who knows anything about that knows that they study film. And they watch the opponents. They look for weaknesses, they, they, and the, they're experts at this. This is what they do. They study them. They, oh, he drops his hand before he... They, they study them. He, he'll move in the... They study. I've heard so... My, my father... My uncle was, uh, was a boxer. I, I grew up enjoying the art. My father... Uh, we watched uh, Friday night fights as long as I could remember while they were on as a kid. I mean, that was my life. I watched a lot of boxing over the years. And you hear the commentators... And they'll say, he studied him. And I understand what that means in a biblical way. Because the enemy studied Job. I'm looking for a weakness in him. Because that's what he does. He, he studies you. He knows your weaknesses. He studies you. He knows what you're susceptible to. He knows how to bring that into your life. To cause you to want to drift off towards it. He knows. That's why we're to be sober and alert. Because we know the devices of the enemy. And we know that he is studying us. And no, it's not because we're crazy and paranoid. It's because he actually does that. When, when God asks or commands Satan, give me an account of what you've been doing. I've been going to and fro throughout the earth. I've been up to no good. I've been looking for evil. And when God said, have you considered? Have you weighed him? Have you looked for weaknesses in him? Have you viewed him? I see him as a righteous man. He hates evil. What do you see in him? You put a hedge around him. Yeah. What are you saying, Satan? I have studied him. I have watched him. And these are the things. Take his wealth. Didn't work. Take his health didn't work he watched him and he's been watching you so have you set your heart on my servant job he's a righteous man there's no one like him you're looking for defects have you found any well yeah he's a good man but he's good because you bless him he's good because you protect him now peter referring to him as your adversary he's an opponent in a lawsuit, that's what the word adversary speaks of. He is what Revelation 12.10 calls the accuser of our brethren. He accuses them before God day and night. So he sees the weakness and then he'll broadcast it. And it doesn't take him much time to find something in us to accuse us before God. But when you have a prosecutor... Someone who's going after you, you need an advocate. You need a defense attorney. So the enemy and our hearts produce condemnation. But Jesus is our advocate. 
In 1 John 2, verse 1, my dear children, I write this to you so you won't sin. But if anyone doesn't, does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You have a prosecuting attorney, and he's named Satan. He is our adversary, but we have a defense attorney, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so we have to be aware that we can condemn ourselves and, and even without his efforts, he can, he can, uh, we can undermine our own walks because our heart will condemn us. And in 1 John 3, 20, John said, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. He knows all things. So God knows you and can do more for you. So what do you do? You cast your care on him. The accuser and our hearts condemn us. But our God, through our advocate, Jesus declares us not guilty. And so we cast our cares on him. He is actively seeking whom he may devour, the scripture says. The word devour means literally to swallow up, to bring to ruin. As a roaring lion, he desires to destroy us by violence, by persecution, even death. What am I to do? Verse 9, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world resist him stand firmly against him when it says resist it, it speaks of an inner attitude of fortitude it, it speaks of holding fast and not letting go and not having fear and how can i do that how can i resist the enemy when he's working overtime to destroy me i stay steadfast in the faith the word faith when it's speaking of that isn't saying the faith that we're saved by or or even the living faith that we... It's speaking of the, the counsel of God. It speaks of the gospel of grace that is building us up and giving us confidence. Philippians 1.27 speaks of the faith of the gospel. And Jude verse 3 says, While I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Remain strong in God's word and use the word of God as a sword. Scripture is God's revelation of truth. And so we remain solidly in it. That's our foundation, biblical truth. Remember when Satan was tempting Christ when Jesus had fasted and then the enemy came for 40 days, began to attempt to uh, cause him to stumble. Jesus was hungry, so, so Satan said, make these stones into bread. And Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone. And so he said, well, cast yourself from the pinnacle of the temple. It's written because Jesus has said it's written. Man doesn't live. Oh, okay, it's written. Uh, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and they shall hold thee up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So cast yourself. And he says, no, you are not to tempt the Lord your God. Well, he says, listen, and he shows them all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, listen, I'll give you all these kingdoms. They've been delivered to me. All I'm asking you to do is worship me. Remember how Jesus said, get, get thee behind me, Satan, because it is written, you shall worship and serve God alone. How do we defeat the enemy? This is so important and very basic. How do we do that with scripture? It's not that I try and work up some faith in me. It's that I spend time in the word of God to know what God's truth is that sets me free and gives to me the ability to deal with the devices and strategies of Satan who wants to destroy my life. I need to know the word of God. That's why it's such a blessing that we're here tonight going through the word together. You see, in spiritual warfare, the enemy works to undermine our trust in the word of God. He attempts to disarm us by calling into question the truth of scripture. He did it to Eve. Has God said was the first question that you find in scripture and it related to God's word from the beginning the number one effort he has had has been to undermine your trust in God's word that's why the first question mark you find in scripture relates to the word of God has God said he's calling into question the word of God he did it from the beginning he tried it with Christ well it is written but he misquoted scripture, and he does it to us. So what do we do? What do we do when we are in the position of being 
tempted to do something that will cause us to, to, to be stumbled and to stumble others. And, well, what we do is we put on the whole armor of God. We hold fast to the word of truth. Is it easy? No. Especially when, you're, when your desire for that thing that's being offered to you can be so intense. So what do I do? James 4, 7, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We resist. Hold fast. And remember, you're not alone. The same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Sometimes you may think you're the only one going through that, and you're not. And then finally, verse 10, and we'll close. May the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So we'll close briefly. May the God of all grace, the one who called us to his eternal glory by Christ, may God's grace ensure us of good in our lives. Because God's grace and by his grace, he's called us into eternal glory with Jesus. And it's by his grace that we've been called, and it is by his grace that we can be assured. And we've been called into what is called eternal glory, a time that we will worship and serve the Lord forever. It's been said that eternal glory is the full expression of our salvation as we reign with him eternally. And so he says, may God perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And settle you. May he perfect. May he bring you into maturity. May he establish you. May he strengthen you and make you firm. May he make you stable. He says strengthen. May he give you spiritual strength within. And may he settle you. May he set you on a firm foundation. And all of this will be the fruit of the fact that you do go through hard times. But remember, your suffering is only for a short time. And then he says, and finally, may God, verse 11, to him be the glory and dominion forever. And so he closes with words of worship and faith. And then he says, by Silvanus, our faithful brother. So he's speaking of Silvanus. Silvanus is also known as Silas. He was a traveling companion of the apostle uh, Paul. Uh, Mark, he speaks of him. That's John Mark. He's referred to as his son. He was a spiritual son. He was the cousin of Barnabas. But this letter is of apostolic and genuine authority, and that's the point he's making. And then he says, finally, in verse 13, that she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you. The question is, what do you mean, Babylon? And so during this time, uh, many commentators have pointed this to be true, and I think this is the right way to approach it. Uh, she who was in Babylon. Babylon was a name for Rome. And it would be speaking of the church in Rome that they would call in a spiritual way Babylon. And then finally, and we'll close with this. He says, greet one another, verse 14, with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. When I was a brand new Christian, I liked that scripture. Because there were some cute little hippie girls there at Calvary Chapel. And I said, no, it's, it's, it's biblical. Come on over here, baby. <laughs> then I found out it was the guys who kissed the, the guys. And then I didn't want to do that. What does that talk about? Well, that talks about, and we'll close with this, that talks about the evidence of a church. Churches can be known for many things, and they should be known for many things. They should be known for their love of the word. Churches should be known for, the, for their concern for those in need. 
Churches should be known for the power of the Holy Spirit. Churches should be known for uh, their faithfulness. I mean, you can, you can go through a thousand and one things, but do you know what the earmark of a believer is? And I'll close with this thought. The earmark of a believer, Jesus said it, by this shall all men know that you are my disciple, if you love one another. If you love one another. You can be a police officer. It's not required for you to love the other police. You can be in the military. It's not required for you to love those people you serve next to. You can be in a fraternity, a sorority. You can be a, a member of a, of a club, a group. It's not required for you to love one another. It's not. You can be a good cop, good firefighter, good soldier, a member of fraternity. You can be all and not, but it is required of you to love one another in the church. It's a requirement. It isn't a suggestion. It's the earmark. It's the birthmark. It's what makes us different than the world because we love one another. And the world, world doesn't love one another. The world uses one another. But the church, he says it, the church loves one another. And when the outside world that is persecuting and rejecting and calling us so many names, we're, we're referred to in so many evil ways now, openly. How much more important is it now than ever before for us to love each other, to hold each other up in prayer, to care for one another, to minister alongside of one another? God, help us to love one another. God, help people to see us and know there's something different about you, and it's not just that you don't do certain things. It's that you do certain things. It's that you love one another. Because one of the phrases in the early days of the church was this, where the pagans said, Behold how they love one another. There was something unusual, because in the, in the days when the church began, that was not a requirement for anything. And people who were were uh, compassionate and caring and, and openly loving, were looked at as also being very weak. And men don't show emotion. And men don't love their wives and they don't care for their children. Men have girlfriends on the side and babies with their wife, legitimate. They call them legitimate babies with their wives, but they had women on the side for their pleasure. And then you have a church that says, no, husbands, love your wives. Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Be with them, care for them, teach them, protect them, provide for them. Lay your life down for them. That was unusual. And why did you do that? Because you loved them. And we not only do that as husbands for our wives, we do, do that. We are to do that for each other, to love each other, to care about each other, to pray for one another, to be of help for one another, to love each other. 